<laughs> All right, I'm laughing at myself. So I, I had the uh, wrong startup screen uh, highlighted there before this started. So it said something about Studio One, which is not at all what we're talking about today. This is Biotech Live. And I know, and of course, I, I have multiple screens running. And when you're doing live stuff, you sometimes don't notice. And uh, I, I actually rewrote that. And then I know what I did. I did an undo a bunch of times. And uh, because I, I noticed, ah, oh, the something got moved over funny. Let's try something here. If I undo, I don't think the undo will work on this. Now nah, I won't in the background. So, um, so anyway, you won't see that. So today we're talking about today. What is today? Today's January 16th, 2024. If you're watching this live, be sure to subscribe. Yeah. Hit the like button all that kind of cool stuff. If you're on, if you're not on Facebook, be sure to join the Facebook group. 3000 people talking about this stuff on a regular basis. And today will be pretty interesting. Hey, Crystal. Thank you. Audio is perfect. That's super helpful. Uh, it's helpful to know that. And then uh, let me move one more screen over here so that I have that. Okay. I just have a bunch of screens going on. And it's always fun. And I did this. If you didn't see the Heller show today with uh, Simon Vance, you should go back and watch that. It's also on the channel. You'll see that. It's very good. Uh, Heller's great. Simon Vance is great. Amazing. Um, and he's got a lot of technical background. But today we're going to talk about effects and uh, some of the bare basics that you need and uh, some of the things that you definitely should have when you're producing audio. And I'll talk about why, and then take all sorts of questions and comments and feedback and things that you want to talk about. We could have talked about 20 things. Uh, so today when talking with Simon Vance and Johnny Heller, we were talking about headphones. And people that have a radio background almost always tend to, have, to be wearing headphones, which is cool, that's fine. Uh, my son did that at first as well. Many people do that. Note that huge numbers do not use headphones. They use studio monitors when they can, or they use one ear on and one ear off, or one uh, uh, earbud on and the other off. A lot of people who are uh, have a lot of acting experience, they actually know what their voice should sound like when they're doing something emotional. And having headphones on creates a different experience, which changes things. And if they don't have a radio, if they have a radio background, they'll get used to wearing something for hours, very potentially, depending on what they did. So some, if they were, especially older school people, people that have been around a while, very often use headphones and do it insanely well. So it's absolutely something that you can do. But I can tell you categorically, some of the best narrators in the world, some of the best voiceover uh artists in the world do not wear headphones when they do 90% of their productions. Almost all of us wear them at some points, but you don't have to. So good studio monitors can be used instead. It does depend on how your software is set up. There's some details there. So I just want to get that out of the way. You do not need to wear headphones to be successful in this business. Now, I know some insanely successful people that are wearing headphones. So don't take it that, oh, you have to wear headphones. Oh, Don says, no, you shouldn't wear headphones. No. You should experiment with fully headphones on. A lot of times that is a very intimate experience. You also hear noise going on in the background. If you're using something like RX or you're, most of the time, I don't think people should be paying attention to that stuff while they are voicing. If I have all the rest of my stuff set up well, if my room is set up reasonably well, 98% of the time, I don't need to be listening for noise while I'm recording. During record time is the time to be focused on our script and our emotion and, and the mood and the, the feel of what we're trying to do, not pay attention to listen for a mouth noise. The tools can take out mouth noise. The tools can take out pops and clicks, it, at least if we're set up well. If we're, if we're not set up well, then okay. If our mic technique is diff decent, then we're not going to be worried about plosives. And if we're, our breathing technique is right, we're not going to be worried about breathing and breaths that are too big and all sorts of other things can be taken care of by your setup, doing things right, practicing some things. So don't think you always need to wear headphones. And if you did not come from an industry where you wore headphones extensively, then I'd suggest you try for a month or two voicing everything off of good studio monitors and see how that goes for you. Most people won't go back other than when they have to. Yeah, some directed sessions need them. When I'm doing a session with Heller, because we have multiple inputs coming in, it's not just him and I, we have a guest. The setup is much more complicated. We need to hear things before the show starts. It's just easier with headphones, plus some software, 
not our normal recording software, will create a feedback loop because I need to hear people in real time and broadcast in real time. So there are circumstances where I still do wear earbuds or headphones, but it's not the majority. Okay, I wanted to get that out of the way. All right, so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about effects. So what effects do you need on virtually all audio that you're going to produce? And I just have a very minimal set. And people overcomplicate this. We do not need 25 utilities. Uh, I saw, let's see, I, I'm going to reconstruct this. I saw somebody that had an EQ curve, and I'm going to do it as fast as I possibly can, EQ in, in uh, RX. And what they did was they had a, a no, no, they had all these bands turned on. I'm going to flip these on right now. Boom, 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 boom. And they had a set of set of these things. I'm going to do this. I'll do this all with my mouse. They had this. They had this. And they had this. And they had this. This is. I mean, it, it wasn't exactly this, but it was pretty close to this. It was kind of like, okay. They they had just set up a bunch of things, and, and it was about like this, right? Now, I'll tell you categorically, don't do that. I mean, first off, these are really fine cues. And what they were doing was they were looking for something called some uh, points in their voice where there are some sounds that they don't like. And that's fine. I have a video out there on EQ sweeping. And there's this concept out there that you are going to hear that you should go through and take a piece of software. You could use RX. You can use Studio One. You can use there are a lot of tools you can use to do this. And what you can do is you can go ahead and... You can sweep, you can be playing back audio and be playing back audio in the background. And you can move through and you will find some things that you don't like the sound of. And then when you find those things, you invert it and do the exact opposite of take out that same spot. I don't believe in this, okay? I'll just tell you categorically. This is like a voodoo that's just, here's, here's why. So let's say you come to me. I used to I used to get paid a lot of money to do this. So I'm, I'm kind of cutting off my income stream from doing this, but I do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. I used to, you could go through and you could find somebody something that doesn't sound good in a certain range. Okay, I found them. You, it's easy to find, and you hear something, and I'll go I go over it in this video, so you can watch the video for the details if you want. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, a direct link to the video, so you can see it. It's called EQ sweeping, but it's really snake oil mostly with a few exceptions, 80% of it, I'll just say 90% of it's snake oil. It just doesn't make any difference. Here's why. As you go through sweeping, every piece of software that you have out there that can do these sweeping things is going to be different. If I set up this exact same sweeping motion in Adobe Audition, or I go to Studio One and I pull up something and I put one of their, put an EQ in there so that I could sweep through. I know what that's called, Pro EQ. And I and I go through. I, I just picked the wrong one. I, that's it, what do you what do you? Oh, there it is, right there. Okay. I take these nodes and I move them, and I do the same thing. And I sweep through all my audio here, and I do the exact same thing on two pieces of software. I do it in Reaper, and then I do it in Studio One. I do it in Audition, then I do it in Studio One. I do it in RX, then I do it in Studio One. I sweep through and I find. And when I'm done, this tool, Studio One, will have a different place where it sounds, quote, bad or harsh compared to when I do it in RX. EQ is much more sophisticated than most people know. There's a big difference, and it's sometimes it's not even quality. In RX is one of the few tools that if you have RX, you can experiment with this yourself. There are a set of tools up here that almost nobody pays any attention to in RX, that if you have this set differently and you were using different settings here, and I'm not going to go over what they are and why they work and how they work, but there are options. Now, here's the difference. RX allows us to select among some, some options. They pick the one that's going to be the most popular. Most DAWs don't. This is something that's unique to a couple different EQ tools here. But here's the weird thing. Let's say I, I determined right here at the 5K mark, Don has something that sounds funny. If I switch this, all of a sudden it no longer sounds funny. So if I put on my glasses, well, let me see. I take off my glasses. You look blurry, okay? I don't think you're blurry for real, but you look blurry right now. Uh, you're the little dot in my camera. I put this on. Oh, you're crystal clear. You look beautiful, okay? Nice to see you. Um, but if I put on a, a different pair of glasses, 
that are higher intensity, what do they call that? More magnification, whatever. I don't know. Good thing I don't sell glass for a living. But if I use different glasses, I might be able to see things. If I use tinted glasses, I can I can cut out the blues. It, every pair of glasses may have different attributes of they could be uh, slightly tinted lenses. They can be blue blockers. They can be for reading. They are for close. They're for distance. A bunch of different things. All glasses are not the same. All EQs are not the same. What you see with one pair of glasses is not identical to what you see on another pair of glasses. And it's the same with EQ. So here you get into this really interesting thing. What if I sound horrible? I have something that sounds terrible right here. But then I go over here to this other tool and I do the exact same thing where I set it up to be as close as humanly possible to the same thing. Later I find out, hey, wait a minute. Here it sounds good, there it doesn't. And I've done this experiment so many times, so watch that video. As soon as some engineer type starts telling you they're gonna sweep through your voice and they're gonna go through and they're gonna change some things and do this and this. And I just saw one guy's curve, I couldn't believe it. It was kind of about like this. And and I just, I didn't even say anything to him because it was kind of one of those things. I didn't want to get involved with that. Oh yeah, now it's back to peaking. So I it was kind of like, okay, cool, you do you. Um, but I remember thinking, man, if you ever see something like this where some guy's gone through or some gal's gone through and they've done this on your voice, if you run it with a different tool, you will get different results. If I put on different glasses, I'm going to see different things. If I put on sunglasses, it's going to block some of the light, but it means some of the shadows. I'm going to see less details. Trade-offs. Heavy, heavy, heavy sunglasses mean that I can stare into the sun if I were outside playing some sport and 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 it will work. But I put those same glasses on at night where maybe there's artificial lights and now there's not enough light. So my vision will be changed by how dark the sunglasses are. The what bothers you, what you sweep through will be different based on which tool you use. I wish they were all the same, but, but uh, EQs are very sophisticated in the background, the good ones. They are, it's amazing some of the things they do. But the math behind the scenes is different. The core of it is the same. And that would be like cooking. Hey, a burger's a burger is a burger is a burger, except for some happen to be better than others or different from others. Sometimes there's two that I really like and one's just different. Same with the EQs. All right, enough of that stuff. Let's see if we get any comments in there. So be sure to go ahead and make comments if you've got them. Let me know if this is helpful. And then uh, we'll talk about effects. So what effects should you have on virtually every voiceover? Well, if you're going to do audiobooks, guaranteed you're going to have at least a couple. And there are variations on them in terms of how they're named. Uh, so sometimes they'll have a different name. A perfect example would be Audacity has a tool called uh, ACX. Uh, ah, they have a tool that will hit, allow you to hit the specs. It's, par it's, a, it's, a, it's a type of compressor and a limiter combined together into one. And I'm drawing a blank on the name of it. Uh, but but whatever, here's a couple tools you'll guarantee you'll need. You'll need some sort of gain. You'll, you'll probably have to increase the volume. So you have to have something that turns up your audio. You're going to need some sort of compressor and you're going to have a limiter. And if you have those three tools, you can do everything. And by the way, if you know what you're doing, many limiters, some of the tools will have gain of their own, but I like it as a separate step. So I have a tool that will add some gain I have a tool that is a compressor, and then I'm always going to have a limiter at the end. And the limiter is always your last thing. And those are the minimal. And note that you'll you'll definitely want a good compressor. Uh, and people go, well, why? You know. Matter of fact, I have people that say, oh, I don't use a compressor because I want to sound natural. And I have a theory about that whole thing. I don't want to sound natural. I want to sound comfortable, warm, and uh, emotional. I want to sound like I am unprocessed, not natural. It, it, you know, some of us, uh, I, I just, I'll just say this, when I was, and, I, and most of you already know this story. When I was 14, I had an accident and I broke my teeth. So you don't want to see me natural. I've seen it a few times in my life where they, I have fake front teeth because the, my front teeth, I was 14, sliding out on some ice at school, and I fell and I uh, broke my front teeth. So nobody wants to see me natural. It's just, it's a bad look. Uh, and I get to see it about once every 15 or 20 years when they replace them. They only last 15, 20 years as a, as a rule. 
And I've had them replaced a couple times and learned to re-speak again. That's always a fun thing, especially when you're an adult. Okay, if you want to have some fun, uh, start talking like a three-year-old again. It's a, it's a joy. And uh, so here's what all that translates to. Compressors, when done right, make you sound natural, normal. And if they're done right, the good ones will actually make you sound more comfortable. Why? Most of us don't realize why do we like having a video chat over having a phone call? I mean, we would all just do clubhouse and audio calls 100% of the time, but there is a benefit to having video. You can see somebody. When you see somebody, your brain is taking in information about what they are saying. You can actually talk faster on a video chat than you can on a a phone call and still have everything work. Most people don't pay attention to that, but nonetheless, here's what happens. Even when you're listening, uh, if you're in person, if you can see the person, an amazing amount of information comes from seeing the person, which means this. When you and I are listening to each other in person, a huge amount of the information for us to hear is what we see. And you, you see it all the time. If you're in an airport or if you're in a, you're in a, a restaurant and there's a t- television on and you cannot hear it, you still can figure out, I don't know, 30% to 70% of what's going on on the show or what they're talking about from the visuals that you see. So what a, here's what a good compressor does. Our voice has some, some, some information that's missing just the, because of the way we pronounce things. And a compressor will even some of those things out to the point to take care of details that would have been picked up visually are now heard more clearly. Let me translate that. When you have a good compressor, it's easier for the other person on the other end to understand what you have said. You will be more intelligible with a good compressor. I might not be more intelligent, but I'll be more intelligible. Good thing or bad thing, people know exactly what I'm talking about if you have a good compressor on your voice. And so all now, like everything else, there's great compressors and there's just okay compressors. So just because you have a compressor doesn't mean it's a great one. But if you use one of the better, more advanced tools, they have great compressors and they make you sound normal, natural, comfortable. People don't need to know why. You can have somebody else set it up for you. But the good ones are really a difference in terms of if someone, especially for you, people that are doing audiobooks or doing long form things, or people are listening to you for hours or five minutes, 30 minutes, if I'm doing an e learning and it turns out to be 45 minutes long, hey, people want you to sound comfortable and things that I could get away with in a 30 second spot or wouldn't matter in a 30 second spot because it's over before they've become acclimated to it, then. I want to be something that's comfortable for them. And a good compressor makes it easier for people to hear what you are saying comfortably and especially for extended periods of time. There isn't an audio book out there that that hasn't gone through uh, some sort of compressor if it's uh, unless somebody's doing some weirdo things. I mean, from the majors, from publishers, from people who know, from the pro editors, they're almost all. Now, there's a couple exceptions. I know some people that get away with it. They'll they'll say, well, no, I want to be natural. And I always think, Yeah, but uh, if I wanted to be natural, I'd still wear a shirt because clothes make the man in my case. In terms of, I look better, okay? Uh, For most people, they will appear better wearing clothes. Hey, there's a few of you out there that look better with no clothes on. Not in that little camp there. Uh, So it's it's a matter of being in in a situation where people hear you. They don't even notice that you have any processing. And that's what I really want. When I'm done processing somebody's voice, I don't want anybody in the world to know their voice has any processing on it. They should just go, wow, that sounds like Johnny Heller. And it doesn't matter what I put on it. It still should sound like Johnny Heller. It should sound like Simon Vance. It should, it, Anna Clemens should sound like Anna Clemens. It shouldn't be some big, oh, wow, she sounds totally processed. Johnny sounds processed. So you're going to have a couple tools, but those are the bare minimum. Essentially, if my top two, other than adding some gain, I'm going to have to add some volume, are going to be a compressor and a limiter. Oh, and by the way, there's this other myth out there that I hear all the time, and it kind of cracks me up. Someone I even saw today in a group, and I can't remember even what, which group I was in, but that your compressor should never be more than three to one. And I'm thinking, 
all right, decent, uh, decent, uh, you know, uh, what is it? That doesn't really make any sense. First off, a compressor is it, the way a compressor works and the amount that it works is dependent upon how much is going into it. So if I had a low signal, I'll get almost nothing out of a compressor. A compressor will fundamentally not work if I have a low enough signal going into it. It's amazing. Compressors are very dependent upon the amount of audio going into them. So yes, you can do makeup gain and all sorts of stuff, but that's different than the way the compressor will work if you have enough sufficient gain going in. So this three to one ratio, yeah, it does depend on which tool they're using. So don't take any of that stuff as absolute uh, rules. I have, I have compressors I'll use at seven to one. And I guarantee you, I've used them on hundreds of thousands of files and they sound fantastic. And I'd never run it that high if it didn't, but it also depends on the details. So just be careful about the generalizations out there. All right, let me see if there's any comments that come in there. Um, do you recommend a stack for audiobooks? Yeah, I do, but um, the stack that I use is in is in Studio One because I know the tools really well. It has some of the best tools in the business because they have a vested interest in their music uh, clients that are putting together 40 or 60 tracks or 20 tracks, and they've spent insane amounts of time. But I can tell you that you're going to have some. This is going to be a compressor. You're gonna add, you're gonna have some gain, so add, have some tool that can turn it up more. Then you're going to have at least a compressor and a limiter. And in most cases before that, I will also put in a, a high pass, low pass. If, if I were doing something like this, I'll zero this back out. And I would end up with a high pass and a low pass on virtually everything I do. I just, there's, 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 there's no, no, no good information below our voice. And, and then once we get in, if we're working audiobooks, it's one thing. If I'm working voiceover, it's another. If I'm going to have music, you're going to hear, uh, for example, Focusrite has a little button that says air and you can add some things you essentially can take. And I'd have to change this the way this is working. Uh, I've got this going the other way. Um, so this is taking off stuff. When you go ahead and you set one of the interfaces here, let me change this to be uh, shelving instead. I've got this one. I'd have to put a shelf. Yeah, let me go in here. I'll shelf, bring this one. Up. There we go. Okay. First off, let me turn this guy off and let's turn this guy on. So now I can end up taking this. I want to turn this off. Hold on just a second. There we go. That's what I want. You'll see a bunch of mics do this where they have a little bit of a gain in the high end. If I'm doing music, it's a whole different animal. Music, music, you'll hear about sparkle and you'll hear about air and you'll hear about some presence in the high end. And absolutely, those are great things if I have a singer and I have music. If I'm doing voiceover, it's almost nothing but noise. Then I can prove it if you ever want. All we have to do is cut off everything. Uh, what, by the way, if you're in Audible, the, almost everything above, last time I checked, 12 and a half K is gone. Brick walled, zero. Okay? They take it all away. It's, it adds no value. And I can show that sometime where I play some audio and uh, take away everything at the top. I'm not going to do that for today. But you can do it. You can take it all off. So these air things are great if you're doing certain types of spots, if you're doing singing and other things, and almost almost unhelpful for voiceover, unless there's going to be a music bed. And then if there's going to be a music bed, then there are some things I will do differently, potentially for a music bed. But if I'm doing audiobooks, nope, nothing above there helps. And since AC, Audible is going to cut it off under 13K, about 12 and a half last I checked, 100% gone. You might as well not be listening to it in your productions with it all there because it's not going to be there. You might as well hear what it's going to sound like. But man, even, fe even female voices, I can cut them off at about 11K and it's, it's just, there's nothing up there helpful overall. So anyway, uh, I hope that helps a little bit in terms of the audiobook stack. It's different with the different tools, but it's the same fundamentals. You're going to add some gain. You're going to have a compressor in there and you're going to have a limiter. And then I have optional tools based on the person. I might have a de-esser running. I would, most of the time I don't, but I, if I need a de-esser, I will have a de-esser running. I will occasionally in some rooms, I'll have an expander running. That can help there. If I'm gonna have RX afterward, I often don't need the expander. Doesn't hurt anything when done well. An expander can take a good room and make it even better. Uh, but if you have a, a, room, a room that's very weak, an expander can expose 
that room as being very weak. So I have a tendency not to run that if I have a, a weaker room. And so depending on what we're doing, um, and then we're gonna have a limiter that keeps things, uh, this is this happened to be a voiceover, so the limiter's not set at the same thing I'd have for an audiobook, but you'll have a limiter at the end to tame those little peaks that go up too high. So if you had some gain, a decent compressor, and a limiter, man, I could master a book, and uh, assuming I have a good, a lot of the sound quality comes from your compressor. A good compressor makes things sound great and natural, a uh, bad compressor makes things sound weird. Um, and the funny thing about human voice, people don't know, oh, you know, the, too much compression, Don, or too much, too much limiting. They don't know that. What they really come down to is one conclusion. Hey, you sound awful, me, okay? So, or you sound normal, comfortable. And that's the, the, kind of the way it comes out. They really don't know the details. Now, if they can A, B, they may say, oh, you sound much more comfortable there than you do there. But a lot of times it ends up being two categories. Something's weird. And if anyone's doing some processing, I love people that go ahead, especially when they do these EQ curves, one of the things they don't realize is certain frequencies that sound harsh all by themselves are balanced out by other things that are in your audio. And the perfect example of that is food. If you ever taste vanilla, I've given this example before to some people, Go ahead and take vanilla extract and just lick the spoon after you use it next time. Horrible stuff. Some of the worst tasting food I've ever tried is vanilla extract. Now, I love it in pancakes and certain kind of cakes and a lot of things. I think it's awesome. But independent or you, let's get it more fundamental. Take a tablespoon of salt and throw it in your mouth all at once. But salt is a is a fundamental great element in cooking in the proper amounts, but all by itself. So that's why when you isolate salt all by itself and take a tablespoon and throw it in your mouth, most of us are going to gag. It's just not good. But that same tablespoon of salt within on top of uh, uh, the right type of meat or vegetables or whatever makes the makes it dramatically better. So it's that same sort of thing. It's all about proportion and what, how it fits together with what's going on. And if you, if you ever have a, a child, not if you have a child, you're around a child, you'll see that they'll eat some things that are just super sweet that are too sweet for the most adults. And they like it. That's cool. That's fine. But most adults would go, ah, it's too sweet. It gets too sweet. And they don't, want a, they don't want a lot of it. They might want a little bit of it. But at some point, it's too much. I, I can go to Cheesecake Factory. I probably could get through two pieces of cheesecake. I've certainly always, I've done one many times. I like a half these days. I'm at that age where a half is enough for me to feel pretty good about it. But I can, if you force me, you know, you don't even have to put a gun to my head. You can just kind of twist my little finger a little bit and I'll eat a whole cheesecake at Cheesecake Factory. My whole slice. I'm not eating a whole cheesecake. <laughs> even I, as much of a sweet tooth as I have, that's not going to happen. But too much of that stuff gets to be uh, pretty intense. All right, so let's look. And so, yeah, as far as recommending a stack for audiobooks, I definitely recommend you're using good tools. If you're, your DAW should have all the tools you need built in. It should come with that. You should not have to go out and buy other tools. But good compressor, good limiter are the two essentials that make the whole thing work, along with some gain. So I hope that helps there. Uh, you don't recommend an EQ curve on a slap? Nope, nope, nope. So these people that, so Larry, you're, uh, so Larry's talking about doing a slight boost at, uh, at a, a, a hundred and six K slight reduction. No, I, you know what? I, I used to get paid a lot of money to make that kind of stuff. Um, I don't do it. Nope. I don't think it helps. It's not uh, necessary. And I'm going to do something here. Let me get it. Hold on. I'll get something here where I can, I can highlight your question there so that it comes up and oh uh, let me see if i do this now so i can't highlight your question now but i see it right there i don't recommend an eq curve on the stack i'll tell you i, I mean it's just the same thing here's the weird it's the it's the balance thing oh and guys are famous for this us guys the reason is you and i are used to hearing ourselves from the inside out and then you hear yourself and it says oh uh, the first thing almost every guy says is my voice sounds thin I, I they'll always say that my voice sounds thin. Uh, it doesn't sound masculine. 
Well, the rest of the world, your mom, who told you you have a nice voice, has heard that thin voice her, her whole life, and she thinks it's great. So does your sister. So, do your, so does your spouse. So do your friends. They're not going, oh, Don would sure sound a lot better if you just add a little bit, maybe at the 500 hertz, you know, we'll, we'll do a, we'll reduce that. Or at 6K, we'll, we'll, put a, we'll put a little boost in there. There's balance in a voice. Now, people, individuals, you know, you can get, you can get, uh, if you've ever gone from full fat milk to low fat or non fat milk uh, or equivalent, pick a food that you go from high fat to no fat or type thing. I, I did that in the, uh, in, in the old days, we'll just say. There was a period of time for all my age challenge friends where the whole world went to no fat, that fat was the enemy of everything. No butter, uh, no cream, low fat, non fat milk, non fat yogurt, et cetera. Everything, the whole world went to non fat for a period of time. We all went crazy back in the day. Yeah, that's our big uh, crazy period. And one of the things I, I went from full fat milk, by the way, as a youngster, I burned enough calories as a teenager, young, maybe 20, that I could, I used to drink extra rich milk. Okay. It'd gag me today, potentially, but. I would get milk that had extra cream in it. And then, so by the time I was in my 30s and this craze comes in about, hey, you have to drop low fat, I learned over a mo about a year or two how to go and I, I toned it down and got to the point where I could drink non-fat milk or 2%, um, something that was with very little fat. And I got used to that taste. And if you transition at some point, you're used to it. And I see all these people that have these interesting curves and they're used to it. That's what they're used to hearing it. It doesn't mean it sounds balanced to the rest of the world or that you sound as good as you could to the rest of the world. You might like it, but I don't know. I'm not selling all my stuff to me. Uh, that's not really where it is. It is good to feel good about yourself. But yeah, I don't put any of that stuff in. And here's the thing. If you have done that for a period of time, there is an adjustment period coming back. When uh, I got into my older adult life and they found out that, hey, you know, margarine is not better than butter. They're a trade-off. And if you don't eat, there are some things in real grass-fed butter, grass-fed, grass-finished butter that are seem to be reasonable for you in moderation. And as I switched back, it's like, yeah, it's different. It tasted different to me. It took me a while to adjust back. Uh, I did learn to eat no fat, all sorts of stuff and learn to like. I liked, uh, you know, milk with no fat in it for a period of years. Uh, then now I'm back to just regular fat milk, you know, whatever the normal, whatever, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever it starts out, that's how I leave it. And that's the same thing with these EQ curves. Um, I'll bet Larry, you could go ahead and send out without that and you will end up, uh, yeah, you've been on skim milk for a <laughs> couple decades. I did too. I went all the way to no fat milk and I was proud of it. And it tasted fine to me. Matter of fact, I, a normal milk tasted way too rich for me. So when I went back the other way, I had to I had to slowly work my way back because at first it was just it was horrible again. So I went from extra fat was fantastic and no fat was yuck. And then I worked my way and because I did it long enough, that seemed normal to me. And because that seemed normal, I was out of balance. But that's you know the way it is. You can adjust. And if you have an EQ curve, and I I. Every time I do one for a guy and I take out their stuff, they hate me for the first month or two. And then later, they'll come back. I've had I, hundreds over time come back and just say, yep, that really turns out to be much better for me. But a lot of the engineer types, man, maybe they make a lot of money setting up a custom curve for people. And really, what are you going to do? You're going to spew. You, you go to somebody who is an audio engineer like me, and I give you something, and I go ahead and take your EQ curve, and I just say, oh, all right, you know what? You would sound a lot better. Look, at, we'll put this in here, and I'm going to drop this by this much right here. And then uh, are you going to go to, uh, first off, people that don't like my stuff, they don't go, wow, that sounds horrible. They go, well, Don must hear better than me. I'm going to leave this if this is what he thinks it should be. And uh, I might not go that extreme. That's, a, that's quite extreme. But let's pretend I wasn't very extreme with it. But I give you this EQ curve, and I say, boy, wait till you hear yourself sound like this. Now, one of the, here's one of the little tricks that happens. But many times engineers will do this sort of thing where I've got a couple little things that are I've boosted and I have something that I've cut. In the old days, we only cut, but you could do both. But anyway, 
depending on how you do it. So what happens is if I if I compare samples, one of them will be louder than another because if I boosted something on the low end, I put this up, this is going to come out louder than the one that doesn't have that boost. The ear is absolutely tainted if I'm hearing short-term samples to louder being better. And so this will sound better to most people short term. Uh, if they if they take the effort to go ahead and volume match them, then that's a different comparison. And then they won't then then this won't win all the time. They, matter of fact, a lot of times it won't win at all. So you also have to volume match your stuff if you're doing any boosts in your in your audio. Depending on what frequency range it's in, it can be perceived as louder or it can actually be louder. And therefore, it skews the whole thing because of the way our brain works. It wasn't optimized to do high-end audio. Our brain is optimized to keep us out of danger. That's why if there's a low-end sound or because if a dinosaur is coming to eat me and those footsteps, I want to hear those from a, while, a little distance away. I would like to hear the tiger coming to uh, have me for lunch from as big a distance as possible. That's those big, heavy footsteps our brain is optimized for something big coming our way. The elephant, the elephant in the room, as they say, or the elephant out in the safari when yeah, a little before my time. Um, but I want to hear that elephant gall galloping up to me at a distance and, and be going, what the heck's going on? I danger, danger, Will Robinson. I need to be sure I'm, I'm taking care of that. Our brain is optimized to deal with that. It's not optimized to have perfectly flat sound because that's not how we survived all the, generations before us. So you go back a few generations and the things that they were listening, they, by the way, they did not have a uh, CD quality audio back a hundred years ago. All right. Uh, matter of fact, <laughs> they didn't have any audio. The recordings were barely around. I think we're, we're a little over a hundred years now, but, but the general population until radio came in, nobody was hearing anybody without seeing them. It was a different, different time. So this stuff's relatively new that we can shape this stuff and most people overdo it because, Hey, I can do it. I can make you sound different. And very few people are going to argue with me if I go ahead and put in, I used to do this all the time. I just made a lot of money on this until I realized I'm not really helping anybody. Uh, I'm not making them sound better, but I am making them sound different and less balanced. And I've heard more stuff that later I've just shook my head and said, you know, that did not help. Furthermore, I set up this tool and do it. it it's going to sound one way. It will not be identical to me going over here to RX and setting up the same exact, what seems to be the same exact thing, and it's not gonna sound the same. It'll be close, okay? All right, oh, we beat the heck out of that for a while. Uh, oh, plant-based milk, yeah. Uh, you, you've seen the almond milkers? There's a great video out there. Go look for almond milkers. There's a guy who does a great video on that on YouTube. So yeah, if you haven't seen that. Um, so for a lot of us, yeah, there are people recommending this other stuff. So anyway, let me look for other questions. And uh, yeah, I'm going to try plant-based milk. I think that's a, uh, that's by, so by the way, that was the thing originally. I like almond milk and I like, uh, originally the first milk that came out was soy milk. So I drank a bunch of that and I did get to nonfat milk. And uh, today I just, I drink small amounts of regular uh, organic milk, full fat. Uh, but that took me a while to get back to. It's kind of funny how that all kind of cycles around. Uh, but by the way, you're over here in RX and even the EQ, they give us the ability to change some details where, <laughs> I'm not even gonna get into all the things. There is a uh, analog EQs or analog emulations. This is a fully digital one, but it's an analog emulation and this is a digital one. Most people don't even experiment with the two types of, of uh, EQ that's available even in RX. And what they don't realize is the Studio One one, these developers decided whether they were gonna go into sound analog or they were gonna take a digital approach to it. They decided what, what they're going to do in terms of the options here, and that's what they give us. When you go to audition, their developers had to go through and they had all those choices that they made their choices. When you go to Reaper, the, their developers made their choices. So they don't all sound the same. And even if you use the same settings, what appear to be the identical settings, you will get different sounds. They don't even give you the, oh, let's go back and forth between 
uh, analog and digital and that kind of stuff. It's just, it's rare. Uh, RX is one of the few tools because they specialize in this stuff, okay? So I hope that helps. Beware of anybody who starts going through and messing with all this stuff. I, I'm not, you know, I don't mean to say they're selling snake oil or anything like that, but I just, oh, uh, here's, here's the other thing that comes into play. What are you playing it back on? What are you playing it back on? If you're on a pair of uh, earbuds, uh, Air, AirPods, that's one thing. You put them on a really good set of Sennheiser headphones, that's another. You have them on Behringer's, that's another. I mean, there's so many monitors out there. And then one of the things is about two thirds of our audience is listening to two thirds of the things we produce off their smartphone. And if they're listening off our smartphone, do they have a good smartphone? Well, that's all subjective. Do they have a more advanced smartphone that has better speakers, worse speakers? Are they using Bluetooth headphones? There's so many playbacks. So here's the other thing that comes into this all the time. If I sound perfect, one thing, I have some great monitors and I have a very quiet room. So when I'm listening back, I can get a pretty good sense of what I'm doing here in this room. And then when I'm listening to things off of YouTube, half the time I'm off of my little cheapo speakers on my cell phone. Sometimes I'll have, I've really got, a, I've got a nice high-end set of, uh, I don't have them in this room. I've got a, both a wired pair of, uh, of Sennheiser monitors here. These are Sennheiser's, some of their best wired monitors. Uh, for my cordless ones, I have a high-end set of Sennheiser's that are Bluetooth. So they're really good too, but they're different. I noticed it kind of cracks me up that they're, how different they are, even though they're both a really good brand and they're not cheap, um, but they sound different. My, I, I just don't have an audience out there that has ever considered buying a pair of earbuds that are more than a hundred bucks as a rule. I mean, it's just, who does that, okay? Unless you're in this business, you don't do it. But if I optimize for my room, one of the one of the things about having a really good room and a really good set of monitors is once you learn what it should sound like in your situation, then you know how it will translate across a set of devices if you do your homework. If you don't do your homework and you decide that you should have something up here at the 200, you have to be really careful that you go ahead and play that on people's uh, connect to Bluetooth versus on somebody's uh, car. Yeah, you know, use Bluetooth speakers, regular speakers, use earbuds, use headphones. If you don't get a half a dozen different references to begin with, man, you have no idea what this really sounds like other than in your space. And if you do something where you've cut something out and those speakers on the other end are not doing a great job reproducing this range to begin with, boy, does that ever distort your stuff. So it's just why staying closer to, to neutral, flat, is going to be a better bet in the 95% case. I have a few cases though, exceptions, depends on the room, depends on their mics, depends on their setup, where I will do something, but it's become so rare that as a generalization, don't do it unless you're really, really good at it and you're willing to do all the testing across all the different devices, okay? So I hope that helps there. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna look for questions here. That's cool. I don't think I even need to refresh that. That one's already there. And then we're going to make sure what's going on in the other one. I've got to look at two screens there. So I appreciate you guys showing up today. Oh, next week, next week, next week. I'm actually attending. Unfortunately, I have a, somebody in my extended family. I'm, uh, I'm going to be coming back from a funeral next week and uh, in my extended family. And so I will miss on Tuesday. This will be moved to Wednesday for next week only. So that's going to be the 24th next week instead of my normal Tuesday. Same with the Heller event next week. We are going to be on Tuesday, on Wednesday because on Tuesday I'm still going to be on my way back from this uh, funeral for extended family there. So um, not unexpected. I have a, a, an uncle who lived a fantastic life. So, so inspirational. Uh, got into late 80s and uh, a gentleman who uh, I cannot believe how many great things he did in his life. So I'm really not happy that he's not around, but I'm really proud and inspired by all the great things he did with his life. If I turn out to do as well over mine as he did, and he's inspirational and somebody who I look up to and always have helped me as a young guy. So I'm going to go play, pay my respects. I'll be back on Wednesday. 
And so, uh, so I'm, you know, sad about it. Cycle of life. I'm almost at that age too. I mean, where <laughs> I might be around next week or I might be around for another 30 years. I'm working on a 30 year plan at least. All right. So you have a fantastic day. Don't mean that on a downer. We will see you next week, but I will not be on Tuesday. It'll be Wednesday. Uh, we'll put the notices up for that. So it's next Wednesday and then we'll be back to Tuesdays. Hope you have a fantastic day. And as always, we'll see you on the wires. See you later. Bye-bye.